a very good afternoon to one and all present here i dr teethra singh along with my dynamic team of center of excellence in healthcare technologies and informatics jp university of information technology vaknaghat solan himachal pradesh india would like to welcome you all on the fifth session of our international webinar series that we are organizing since last 5 months so today we are having one speaker uh, our very own alumni ms mimansa sood she did btech bioinformatics from jp university like 2008 to 12 batch but before that we had four different sessions and those were really uh, well accepted by all the audience at global level and this is the fifth one and we are planning to continue with this like we are doing one seminar per month our this center of excellence was established in 2017 and then we are doing uh, many such activities like organizing workshops organizing this international webinar series and we are planning to organize some international conferences in near future also so these are some of the activities we are doing some in house research projects are going on that have been distributed to btech mtech msc and phd students of our university but before proceeding further first i would like to call upon our uh, hod sir professor sayal to say a few words and then we will proceed professor sayal thank you dr tilak and uh, it is a nice effort that uh, our center of excellence uh, is uh, actually organizing uh, almost monthly uh, these uh, webinars and uh, today the speaker is uh, may mansa sood who is our proud alumni of the department and uh, i'm very happy to see her progressing in academics and in her life and working overseas and uh, i personally know she is a uh, very hard working and uh, a great uh, uh, having a potential to be a great academician and researcher and uh, we are looking forward to her presentation and i also feel that because uh, uh, i know that she is actually uh, living very nearby to us uh, her parents are very near to uh, jp university and uh, we have uh, uh, like um, uh, like they are my personal friends also and both are uh, very nice very good great and you know somewhere when the parents give uh, a good atmosphere and Uh, teachers together uh, make uh, uh, such a good uh, uh, you can say a student and a future scientist so we are very happy to see you mimansa uh, to see here and you are devoting time for your presentation and i am very sure when you will come back to india uh, we will have your uh, seminar uh, physically present here so that you can uh, interact with our students and uh, give your guidance views Uh, that will be great on your part, and uh, so always welcome. Whenever you come back, please do visit us, and uh, this is your university. So now we look forward to your uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very thank much, you. sir. Uh, just wanted to tell you when I joined JP University in 2010, Mimansa's batch was the first batch I taught them, and I remember <laughs> July 2010. and this was the first real batch that i taught here btech bioinformatics so i am really connected to all these students very well but before going to uh, further i just want to tell you that mimansa's proud parents are already in in this <laughs> webinar <laughs> okay. so i am really happy namaskar sir and we welcome you also and we are really proud of your daughter she is a wonderful daughter and she had done lots of hard work during last uh, like one decade No I am sure she is also making you all proud. So now I would like to call upon uh, uh, first uh, my better half Ragini. She will introduce you to the speaker uh, Mimansa, and then we will proceed further. Ragini, to you. Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to all from Team Chehti, JP University of Information Technology. As you all know, that today we are having our uh, alumni Mimansa Sood. Uh, she is going to present today. Uh, and this is our fifth talk of the series and uh, uh, what i can say that i am very delighted to introduce bimansa as we know her since i think last 10 years so uh, so i will start now as uh, you know already as told by sudhir sir and uh, dr teethraj that uh, uh, she did uh, btech bioinformatics from here so i also know her since last 10 years so okay so i will introduce formally now her so after uh, doing uh, her btech Uh, she has joined industries 
at Biocos Life Sciences Bengaluru and there she worked in industrial training program that has been organized by Department of Biotechnology Government of India. Then she has also worked in Biotech Park, Lucknow, in industry itself. Thereafter, she worked as software engineering associate in Accenture Services Private Limited. And after doing the jobs in Accenture Services, uh, she joined Fonhofer SAI, St. Augustine, Germany, as a student assistant and worked on systematic harvesting of information about clinical trials and generation of clinical trial documents. After that, she did her master's from the Bonn Archen International Center for Information Technology, Bonn, Germany. And she completed her thesis on the topic that's development of a longitudinal mode for Alzheimer's disease to predict the trajectories of the biomarkers. Currently, uh, what I can say that she's about to complete her PhD in computational life sciences itself. And uh, she's working right now on the topic that is development of patient level longitudinal models of neurodegenerative diseases based on information extraction and information fusion. She has also published her research papers in International Journal of Repute. Presently, she is working on some prestigious projects. She is part of those projects. And these projects are Radar AD and Virtual Brain Cloud. Okay. So now I would like to invite Mimansa to deliver her talk. Today, she is sharing her knowledge with us on the topic longitudinal modeling of Alzheimer's disease using machine learning methods. I am very sure that this talk will be beneficial to all the participants. So now uh, over to Mimansa. Welcome Mimansa. Thank you so much, ma'am. So uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank all of you for such kind words and for introducing me. And uh, I think it wouldn't have been possible without uh, me going into JP and then studying there and getting introduced to bioinformatics and having such nice uh, guidance from Tirath Raj sir, Sudhir sir. And also, I would also like to mention the Pankar sir, under whom I did my thesis. And basically, um, during my thesis, I got motivated to pursue my career further in bioinformatics. But yeah, before that, I wanted to have some experience in the field of uh, like industrial experience before uh, finalizing my decision. So thank you so much. And I'm very happy to uh, present here and I'm very happy to uh, be a part of uh, JP Institute again in some way. So I think uh, I will I, I, and I would also like to thank my parents for joining this talk i think this is the first time they are going to see me something uh, they are going to see something what i'm doing actually <laughs> so i'm really uh, excited for that as well uh, so i will share my screen now yes Uh, so, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, yes, Mimansa. Mansa. Now we can see it. Okay. So, as uh, rightly mentioned by Ragini Ma'am, that today's topic uh, is about longitudinal modeling of Alzheimer's disease using machine learning methods. So, this is uh, like in this area I'm working for the past, I would say kind of four years right now. Uh, I started working on longitudinal modeling in my master thesis and then I started my PhD uh, around this topic. So I would uh, talk a bit about uh, Alzheimer's disease and then about machine learning me methods in Alzheimer's disease. I think uh, Aragini ma'am already uh, gave me uh, gave the, uh, my background uh, in very detail but Maybe I would just like to show my very nice universities where I have uh, I have worked and I have studied. So I think this is our very beautiful JP University <laughs> where I was privileged to study. And this is my University of Bonn where I did my master's and currently also doing my PhD. And this institute is Fraunhofer Institute. It's a Schloss, which is the name of a palace basically in German. And uh, this is a place where I'm working right now uh, as a PhD student. 
So I would also uh, like to give a small background about the department I'm working in. So the department is known as Fraunhofer Sky Bioinformatics. So Sky as in scientific computing and artificial and algorithmic informatics. So head of the department of our uh, in, uh, of our institute is Professor Dr. Martin Hoffman Apicius, and we have, I'm working in a research group for artificial intelligence and data science, which is led by Professor Dr. Holger Frolisch, and he will also give a talk in this webinar next month. So uh, in our department, basically in AI and data science group, we are working on com different types of models. We are working on combining knowledge and different mechanisms with artificial intelligence models. We are also working on generating time series models from the longitudinal data. And then we are also working in multi-model, multi-scale data fusion, which basically leads to precision medicine and drug discovery. Uh, and the experience with data we have is related to, we have different types of data, which is multi-omics data, and we have clinical real world evidence data. We also have imaging data, which is basically the MRI scans and then digital biomarkers. This is a recent development which is going on in the field of neurodegenerative diseases, wherein the patients are basically uh, wearing all the digital devices, for example, smartphones, accelerometers, etc. And all these digital biomarkers are being collected from these uh, these devices and they are known to be more accurate as uh, compared to the normal pen and paper tests and then we also have unstructured data which is in the form of publications or clinical notes so this is just the brief introduction of my group now i will uh, start with my talk uh, which is uh, which will be on first i will talk about a bit about alzheimer's disease what it is and then uh, what are the challenges we are facing in the current research and then what is what is our goal to further overcome these challenges and third is longitudinal modeling for patient networks uh, uh, sorry longitudinal modeling using vision networks and uh, applications in the real world so let's first see what actually alzheimer's disease is so alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia known as of now and 60 to 70 percent of cases of dementia are caused by Alzheimer's disease. It is an irreversible chronic neurodegenerative disorder. It's very uh, very rare chance that it will ever reverse back uh, to normal disease uh, to normal state. And uh, how it is how it is uh, de detected in the patients basically patients undergo a gradual decline in their cognitive abilities in their memory functions and also normal behavior and activities of daily living so at so in the dementia state patients are not able to perform basic activities like eating or taking a shower or even movement is very 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 less and then uh, until now, scientists have not fully understood the cause of Alzheimer's disease, and they suggest that disease is caused by different molecular and cellular changes which occur in the brain, but still a lot of research is going on to understand what is the actual cause of the disease. So there are different disease stages of Alzheimer's disease. There is a preclinical AD, AD meaning Alzheimer's disease. Preclinical AD is no symptoms are occurring in this uh, in this stage then there is mci stage which is called mild cognitive impairment and this is due to alzheimer's disease here very mild symptoms are, uh, are are occurring which interfere with everyday activities then there is a mild uh, stage of dementia in which symptoms interfere with some everyday activities of daily living then there is a moderate stage in which the symptoms are interfering with many everyday activities and finally in the severe stage symptoms are interfering with most of the activities of uh, everyday activities so this is the basic uh, stage of the alzheimer's disease and uh, it is known that these symptoms could develop over 20 years uh, before, uh, um, the, sorry, the disease could develop over 20 years before the actual symptoms are showing in the patients. And that's why it becomes even more difficult to devise a treatment of this disease. Uh, mild cognitive impairment in patients uh, 
sorry, uh, I think this I already said. And uh, MCI patients may develop AD. They, they can also remain stable or revert to normal. So we have to understand that MCI, which is my cognitive impairment, is not always due to AD. It could also be due to any other uh, any other disease, or maybe it's just there in the patient, but patients can remain uh, can revert back to normal after some time. Now, these are some of the primary uh, biomarkers which are uh, influencing the Alzheimer's disease. So this is uh, this is the amyl. Uh, first, first of all, I would like to mention that there are uh, three types of proteins, which is beta amyloid plaques, total tau, and phospho tau. So these amyloid plaques are actually precursor uh, are actually broken down from a precursor protein called APP protein, which is amyloid precursor protein. If you see here, these are some uh, some amyloid pla plaques which are the which are formed between these neurons. And, there, and therefore, they restrict the signals between the neurons and disrupts the neuronal activity. Then we have total tau, which is uh, neurofibrillary tangles, and these are formed inside the cell body as well as the exon. So usually, there should be signals transmitted from like this is the this is the norm. Uh, this is the state of a normal uh, patient, and this is the state of the Alzheimer's disease patient. So usually, uh, the signals should transmit from ex uh, exon from exon from cell body to the exon. But due to these tangles, this uh, activity is also disrupted, and this is responsible for basically giving nutrition to the brain. And this this activity is disrupted because of these tangles. And phospho tau is also involved in the uh, in the generation of these tangles. <clears throat> also, if you see a healthy brain, it looks like this. But in severe Alzheimer's, the brain is very much uh, the brain is shrunk a lot, and uh, this is due to these plaques and tangles. There are some other biomarkers which uh, which uh, are called imaging biomarkers in in AD and there is a, a biomarker called PIB PET which represents a direct measurement of amyloid plaque burden and the second one is FTG PET which basically measures the central metabolism of glucose and is indicator of neuronal and glial function and it is also responsible for loss of synaptic activity. So if you see here this is taken from this image is taken from this paper below and this is a um, this is in German, which means healthy. So this is a brain of a normal patient, and this is the brain of a dementia patient. And if you see here, the glucose metabolism uh, is uh, basically this FTG PET biomarker can be shown to, uh, I mean, this is different in Alzheimer's patient, and this is different in a healthy patient. And for example, if you see here, the PIB PET, PIB PET basically uh, shows that how much amyloid plaque is deposited in the brain. So here you don't see any amyloid plaque deposited in the brain, but here these uh, green and orange uh, signals. If you see, this is a this is a dye which is used to uh, uh, see the imaging biomarker, and you see that it's a lot it's a lot bad in Alzheimer's patient. Then there are certain um, biomarkers from uh, which we can detect from magnetic resonance imaging, so MRI scans, and uh, they can detect the cerebral atrophy of the brain. And there are two types of MRI scans: structural and functional MRI. Structural MRI basically gives the, how much the structure uh, is different in the normal, the health, and, and Alzheimer's patients. Uh, but uh, the functional MRI can also detect some signals which can see that how uh, a brain is functioning it's a very new type of mri and it can uh, it can detect some signals regarding the function but here i want to sh uh, show you that how the health brain so basically which brain volumes are affected in the healthy and which brain volumes are affected in alzheimer's so if you see healthy brain is look looks like this but if you see alzheimer's disease there, there is a shrinkage of hippocampus, which is the main part of the brain volume, which is responsible for memory collection. And you see enlarged ventricles here. This one is enlarged ventricles and shrinkage of cerebral cortex. So these are some of the volumes, brain volumes, which are 
affected in Alzheimer's disease. Then uh, cognitive and functional impairments are also affected for MCI and Alzheimer's uh, disease uh, patients. Uh, like I said, they, they, uh, their functional capabilities of performing activities of daily living is impaired very much. So if, uh, if we want to see that which biomarker is affected first, so first is CSF amyloid beta, then tau, then MRI and FTG PET. And further, if a patient is healthy, uh, sorry, if a subject is healthy, then and it has a low risk factors of cognitive and functional impairment. It can also have cognitive uh, decline uh, in MCI, but with low risk factors, the cognitive decline will be delayed. But with health, but with high risk factors, the cognitive decline uh, will become uh, will come early, and MCI stage will also come early, and therefore ED stage will also come early in the patients. So it all also depends on the risk risk factors of the patient. So these are some of the statistics of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it has been estimated that about 5.8 million individuals aged above 65 live with Alzheimer's in USA. And worldwide, one, one in every 10, person, 10 people have uh, Alzheimer's disease who is over 65 years of age. And if you see here, uh, this is a statistics from United States in 2020 uh, from 5.8 million population. So about 17% 17, 17 of 65 to 74 years of patients have Alzheimer's and then 75 to 84 years, meaning 47% of the patients have Alzheimer's and 36% of 85 above 85 years have Alzheimer's, which is a very, very high number. And, this explains that why there is a lot of research going on in this domain. Also, if you if you uh, researchers have predicted that how it would look in 2050, and they they predict that it would be about 13.8 million people above 85 would have Alzheimer's in 2050, which is a very, very high number. This is the statistics of the United States. So in the world, it would be even higher. So what are these, what are the challenges in today's research and goal? Why do we need to do what we are doing? So there is an unclear etiology of diseases. Like I said, Alzheimer's disease has a, is a complex disease and it has very uh, multifactorial disorders and uh, a longitudinal understanding of the disease is required that how the disease progresses over the period of time. We need to agglomerate and understand multi-scale data. So for example, I showed you different biomarkers for Alzheimer's. We have neuroimaging biomarkers, we have molecular biomarkers, then we have different cognitive and functional tests. We have genetic variations. So genetic variations could include SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms. These neuroimaging include brain volumes, which I just showed you. Then to, there are tests, clinical tests, which are uh, taken from the patients to measure how good the patient is performing in terms of his cognition or functional abilities. And then there are omics, which are like proteomics or uh, metabolomics data from molecular mechanisms or pathways, which have been affected in Alzheimer's disease. So there is a lot of data, and how do we understand this multi-scale data? That's a big question. A lot of clinical trials have been failing and uh, around established hypothesis. So there is always a new hypothesis which is being constructed in Alzheimer's disease, and that's the reason that why uh, doctors are not able to understand until now that what is the actual cause of the disease. There have been intermittent patient dropout. So when there is a clinical trial, the patient tend to drop out. That would that could also result in result in the bias in the results of the study, and that's a big problem. There is a lack of enough neurological data as well. So uh, we could have some variables of these patients, but we might not have the entire variables of of the same patient. That is also one of the major drawback. Then there are also data silos. Data silos are basically small subsets of the data which are also sometimes not allowed for sharing 
within uh, within the institutions or across the institutions. So this is one of the main challenge that if we don't have the data, how do we even do our research? There are biases and ex inclusion and exclusion criteria of a clinical trial. So we can we can predict some results on one clinical trial, but are these results uh, valid for another study? That is also a big question. And there is over representation of specific geographical regions and ethnicities. For example, the data I worked on is the data from US. So the geographic region here is United States. And how can we generalize this results for the other parts of the world? That is also a big challenge. And collection of different outcome measures and molecular data in different studies of the same disease. So how do we collect all this data? So what our goal is basically to understand first the disease in a longitudinal manner. And we want to describe all this data which I, which I showed in my previous slide using a Bayesian network, which will further take into account the patient dropout, sorry, dropouts of a study before the completion of the study. And we also aim to simulate the virtual patient cohorts in order to solve the problem of data silos. We want to let the data scientists understand the utility of the data sets without even having access to them. So let, let me begin with the vision network. So, uh, so first of all, I would like to show you that how a longitudinal cohort looks like or what is exactly a longitudinal study. So basically, this is a, a study which is uh, in which the patients uh, in which the patient variables are recorded over a period of time. As you see here, these are the number of research participants and these are the uh, these are the follow up visits. And this is like after either some months or either after some years, it depends entirely on the study. But then after some time, the patient will drop out. So if you see that the patients are dropping out uh, and after uh, after a certain number of months and uh, for these num for these uh, number of months the partic participants are not screened yet so i mean this is just an example of a longitudinal cohort i want to give you so that you understand uh, what exactly we are going to do now so uh, our approach is basically basically a generative modeling approach so in a generative modeling approach we can uh, generate the new generate some more patients from the model so we can uh, we can also understand the disease in a better way uh, so i will now see and uh, now i will uh, show you how it works so we have a limited uh, sample size uh, in maybe like a few hundred patients and the data is highly heterogeneous heterogeneous meaning like many variables of different distributions and numerical scales and uh, we have longitudinal data with many missing values. Like I said, the patient dropout, so it leads to many missing values. And uh, example of this is observational cohort studies. And for this respect, we developed a Bayesian network with modular architecture and autoencoders encoding defined group of features in the data. So I will explain to you what exactly this is in the next slides. So let us see what Bayesian network is. So Bayesian network describes the conditional probabilistic dependencies between the variables. So for example, if you see here, this is a small, very small graph between three nodes. We have a, a APOE4, which is a genotype, and we have two alleles of, of APOE4. So now here we will see that how this allele is basically uh, connected to this allele and this node is connected to this node. So these are nodes and the these are the edges between these nodes. So edges are representing the conditional dependencies among the variable. And, uh, and we see here these are conditional probability dependencies tables. So for example, here we will see what exactly is the probability of occurrence of uh, L0, 1, or 2. And uh, here we will see uh, what is the probability of occurrence of this variant of 0, 1, 2 
depending on this variant if it was zero then how uh, the what is the probability that it was also zero if it was one then what is the probability it was also uh, it was also one so this is basically a conditional probability dependencies table and this will uh, this re represents that how these nodes are connected in the graph so for example if you see if you understand this small graph here you can also imagine that how Bayesian network can model the temporal process. So basically, a temporal process is basically the longitudinal process and how this will model it. It, it includes the values of random variable and discrete time points. So these basically, uh, these uh, nodes are called random variables. So this, uh, uh, this Bayesian network follows uh, follows a uh, directed acyclic graph, uh, directed acyclic cyclic graph structure. It represents causality in machine learning. So what is causality? In reality, we don't know the true causal graph, but we can learn features of it from the data. So we have a, a CPDAG graph. This is partially directed acyclic graph. And then uh, we have a uh, data, which is our clinical study. And we, through some algorithms, we learn different directed acyclic graph. And finally, we will get a predicted causal effect or quantitative uh, causal graph. Why it is quantitative? Because this is represented as conditional probability dependency table. So uh, we will have finally a directed acyclic graph which will represent causal effects so uh, this can also be used to model and learn causal relationships like i said and there are certain learning algorithms which is uh, used to model this i won't go too much into detail uh, for these learning algorithms and there needs to be some prior knowledge uh, which should be included into this into this graph structure so for example we have single nucleotide polymorphism and this is a because this is a genetic feature we know that it cannot be influenced by any other clinical features so therefore we need to add this constraint in our network in order to in order to in order for the network to learn precisely we have further possibilities with the bayesian networks we can simulate our simulate more patients and we can also generate certain what if scenarios and we can also make predictions from the Bayesian network, but this I will talk later. So this is one of the example of how the Bayesian network models the data in a longitudinal fashion. So if you see here, we have uh, certain features which are demographic features. This is just a hypothetical graph. This is not a real graph. This is, this is how it can look in the real time. So we have demographic features like gender, age, and SNPs. And then we have certain CSF biomarkers, which I showed you earlier, like cerebrospinal fluid, amyloid beta, tau beta. And then some. we also have cognitive test scores. So these can be connected to each other over the period of time. Uh, like this is baseline. So baseline is the initial time point. And then we have visit one, visit two, visit three, and so on. And these all can be connected to each other over the period of time. So like I said, the edges represent the statistical dependencies. And these are only partial known in, known in practice, but the network will learn, uh, network will learn from the data. Nodes are the random variables, which gives rise to Bayesian networks. So then it, uh, I also want to uh, discuss about the what if scenarios, like I told you, what are what if scenarios? Basically, what we can do in our data, we can make people 20 years younger and we can see how this can affect on the conditional probability tables of all the statistically dependent variables. So for example, we have a dementia subject, and if we make that subject 20 years younger, we, we would see that how his other biomarkers are uh, behaving. Are they different from the dementia 
a subject or are they closer to a normal subject so this can also be done and this this is done by well established theory for simulating interventions which is a, a judia pearls to calculus theory and it amounts to conditional probabilities in a mutilated causal bayesian network so what is mutilated causal bn basically here you see a graph and we have a connection four from one and two so here what you will do if you have to uh, see the what if scenario for node four we will basically break the connections one and two in order to in order for it to see what the resultant is from what if scenario then like i told you there is also a big challenge to deal with the missing data so we also overcame this challenge and i i won't go too much into detail what types of missing data are there out but there is one important type of missing data which is called as missing values not at random and these values are actually we don't know uh, why they are missing so we cannot impute this data straight very straightforward and this uh, missing values not at random sometimes they show a pattern and uh, they can occur like for example drop out of patients or oh, sorry drop out of patients and complete sets of variables have not been measured so like i said we can see a pattern and it could example lack of time during the visit and uh, approach uh, to basically model this is by model missingness by auxiliary variables so what are auxiliary variables this are this is the indicator variables for example here you have a connection of tyrosinosis at time point t to biomarker then you have a connection of tyrosinosis time point t plus 1 to another biomarker so if you will see that this biomarker is missing yes or no and there will be auxiliary variable representing this missingness of this biomarker which is an indicator variable and further there will be another indicator variable for this biomarker which will represent the missingness and these will also be connected because this is the same biomarker so this is the same biomarker over different time points so their missingness should also be related so this is just the basic idea of how to deal with nmar data if may, maybe some of you would uh, overcome this you can probably refer to this one then further we simulate the patients so what we do we draw the samples from the bayesian network because it's a generative model and uh, we also sample from we, we basically sample from the conditional distribution of the parent node and we also uh, we have like the chin, uh, we have we also sample from the children nodes by conditioning on already drawn values from each of the parents so this is like we we are sampling uh, their conditional distributions from the parent nodes and the child nodes now i will come to the applications in the real world like how we applied this data to our study so i would like to uh, talk about a little bit about the study called adni which is which is the till now the longitudinal study longest longitudinal cohort available so it's the study started in 2014 uh, sorry 2004 and it is still ongoing so this is how uh, longitudinal studies look like for example we have a baseline and we have like uh, sorry this is how the adni study look like so we have baseline and we have month 6 month 12 and month 24 then we have different biomarkers we have imaging biomarker we have cognitive csf pathways and snps plus epoe because they are both genetic biomarkers and this represents uh, the blue color represents that uh, all these biomarkers were available and the pink color represents that these are missing so we also have to see that if the biomarkers or the variables are missing uh, more than 50% we remove uh, that particular variable and we only take the variables with less than 50% of missing values at every visit so uh, because this is a 
this is a huge data like we have a lot of imaging biomarkers we have a lot of cognitive features so we also need to do dimensionality reduction and this in our case is done by auto encoders which i wouldn't explain in much detail but this is a neuro neural network technique uh if you would know about the dimensionality reduction techniques like pca so this is a little bit advanced version of pca and uh, here we have uh, for example we have different biological features at a particular visit and because they are so many we want to compress these multiple variables into one variable using the auto encoder so we develop this is called a meta feature and we develop a biological meta feature at visit n so for example here i showed you these all are meta features of all these uh, different types of individual features which i talked about earlier why do we need to do this because if we don't do this it increases the complexity of our of our model and it is not easy to uh, easy to gain uh, obtain these connections between the model if we have too many features so uh, like i said we also need to have constraints for possible edges for example we need to have a time constraint which means we have uh, nodes at time t for example a particular variable at time t and a particular variable at time point t minus 1 so our my future time point cannot affect my previous time point so how my brain volume will be in month 6 cannot affect how my brain volume would be in month zero so this constraint should also be provided to the model and then there is a marker constraint so this is like what can be the allowed edges between the groups at every visit so for example can imaging biomarkers be connected to biological biomarkers and there cannot be uh, other way around so it could be only connected biological could only be connected to imaging for example here and then a uh, patient history can it be connected to imaging as well so this is also like constraint we need to give to the model so this is one of the results i want to show you for alzheimer's disease which we built for the bayesian network from the bayesian network so for example here we have different cognitive scores and here we have dx is basically diagnostic so if the patient was mci of the patient was dementia or if the patient was normal uh these represents the dx and then we have snp feature which i already told you is the polymorphism and then we have a csf biomarker so why you see that and this dot bl is basically at baseline And M zero six it is at month six. M twelve is at month twelve. M twenty four is at month twenty four. So why CSF is only at baseline because of lot of missing data. So if we don't have like even fifty percent of the data present, we cannot model it. So we had to remove the other uh, time points for CSF as of now. And then we have demographic features like gender and marital status. So. here we we see that are the brain and these are the brain volumes so we see that the brain volume at baseline affects the brain volume at month 6 further month 12 and month 24 and we also see that the polymorphism is uh, snp feature is connected to the csf feature which is also uh, expected because this is a genotype Uh, which would which 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 can affect the proteins further and here we have the fdg which i also showed you earlier and here we see that the snp is affecting the fdg further and the snp can also affect the cognitive um, cognitive domains uh, of the patient so for example if you have uh, if you have a certain genotype which is known to cause alzheimers you are more prone to these the biomarkers being disrupted and then further the diagnosis is made based on 
also the cognition and then the cognition affects the diagnosis and further on and further on. So like I said, we generated virtual patients. So virtual patients is basically similar to the real patients, but they are not same because uh, we want to work on these patients and we want to solve the problem of data silos. So therefore, uh, in order to test that how good these virtual patients are, we developed a classifier which basically classifies the real and the virtual patients. So if the classifier performs, classifier performs bad, meaning uh, here good will be if it is near to 70%, 80% or even 1% or 100%, but our classifiers perform bad, like they are lying below 50% or somewhere between 50 to 60% or 50 to 55%. You see, this is the median and this is lying very low. So our classifier should be bad because should perform bad because this means that virtual patients are similar to real patients. So we don't want them different. And we generated a lot of virtual patients. We tested like around 1300. We have 689 patients which are original patients and then we generated more than 1300. We also generated more than 2000, 5000 and 10,000. And these all came out to be very close to the real patients. Then we also generated a what if scenario. For example, what we did, this is a graph you see of real and simulated patients. What we did, we moved the cognition scores uh, of the dementia subject to the normal scores. And we see the shift of the diagnosis to more healthy outcomes. So for example, if you see here, in the real subjects, they all are dementia. But when uh, in the simulated subjects, we see that it is basically increasing. The numbers are increasing and they are more shifting towards normal. So there are very few dementia subjects and then there are more MCI and then there are even more normal. And with the passage of months, the MCI is decreasing and the normal are increasing. So this is one of the one of the validation of the counterfactual scenarios, which basically gives us that how we can alter the data or we can uh, and we can see the diagnosis. And we have also applied these methods on other disease like Parkinson's disease. And we have also seen that what can be an effect of a treatment from if a, if a treatment is given in one study, what can be effect can be the effect of this treatment in another study? So this has also been done. So uh, at the end, I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, just I wanted to uh, want to say that this method which we have developed is a novel method for simulating longitudinal clinical study data, and there are several clinical uh, several use cases of this method. The it can also lead to the clinical trial design because if we have these counterfactual simulations and if we can already try to simulate these interventions in a virtual atmosphere, we can design the inclusion and exclusion criteria for a clinical trial in a better way. And then uh, this, uh, this can also ri give rise to a global meta cohort. So we, we could have different studies and we can generate different virtual cohorts and further on we can have a global cohort which could actually be generalized for the whole population and then uh, in the data science perspective it can help data scientists understand the data they cannot if they cannot directly access the data they can uh, they can have this virtual cohort because it is exactly the same uh, distribution as the real cohort and they can train the AI models with the synthetic data and then we have a clinical routine so in clinical routine there is we can generate patients like me scenarios so for example we have a particular patient and we want to generate similar patient like that and this is called a patient like me scenario within global meta cohort so then this meta cohort would be the reference 
for every type of study. So these are uh, the references for this work. And I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who, whom I worked with and my supervisor. So thank you so much. And uh, please uh, feel free to ask any questions. So this is. OK, Mimansa, thank you very much. It was very nice uh, talk uh, from very beginning, like making some background on very important topic, actually. Because we know mm -hmm. that Alzheimer is having a problem worldwide and uh, India actually people are even unaware of it still. Yeah. Because we, we can easily get the data or stats from US or other European countries, but it's mm -hmm. really difficult to get the exact stats in India like countries. But we are uh, improving and I'm sure we will get it. But before moving further, I just want to ask some queries which are in the yeah. chat box. I will lead them one by one so you can suggest your answers okay we have first okay. query from dr manohar and he's asking can we measure the stage of alzheimer's disease with internet of things iot can we measure the alzheimer's stage with iot internet of things is it possible what is iot sorry i'm not aware of that yeah internet of things but what is internet of things if you can clarify a bit yeah, actually, nowadays, you know, IoT is very hot topic and everybody is talking about it. The thing is that how with the help of uh, connecting networks, we can solve the real life problems, which can be related to health sciences, agriculture sciences or anything else. So how this technology can be helpful in solving the real life problems by making uh, connections with all the existing information. And that is actually yeah. the Internet of Things. OK, OK, OK. I was not aware of that. Yeah, I think this could be done because what we have done is we have done uh, it on real data. So we have uh, existing data available, and then we uh, establish connections between the existing data. And we are also trying to now establish connections in the EHR studies, which are the electronic health records. So which would be even more uh, precise for the doctors uh, because uh, these are the observational cohorts because these are used for prediction but we we can do this i mean if that is the question and if i was if it satisfies your question okay uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. yes uh, actually i have to go uh, now but uh, before leaving i would like to uh, sure, sir, convey, sir, please. convey my thanks to mimansa for a uh, a very good presentation and Amimansa, um, your presentation and your slides they are very good like uh, very balanced and uh, i really enjoyed the presentation i had just one question uh, sorry i am asking this question ahead of uh, the other uh, the okay. question is like, uh, recently uh, i heard about aging reverse genes recently the scientists uh, actually they had this aging reverse genes and they could restore the function of ear loss, eyesight lost. So I was looking into that. So do you feel that uh, if this aging reverse gene can also partially restore the function of uh, normal function uh, of the Alzheimer patients? Uh, and today also it was in news. Uh, I was hearing in radio that the, the experiments, they were very good and they could find out and could do aging reverse genes and they were doing with especially eyesight and other uh, loss of function. Okay. To be honest, I think I, I didn't, do not know about this aging reverse gene so much. But I would say it is very difficult for Alzheimer's disease because uh, this is a very complex disease. And right now, because we have not completely understood, we have not completely understood the etiology of the disease. So which gene we need to focus, that will be a big question because there are a lot of genes which are uh, involved in the Alzheimer's disease and not just one. So that is a big, big, big challenge. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yes, sir. I, yeah, sir, I want to add on to You're that. Welcome, actually, sir. The, the, the one that you are asking for the reversing of aging, actually, I have gone through that article and they actually performed the experiment specifically on few parameters related to skin uh, uh, reversing of the okay. aging. Okay. And they were successful, and th this was done in Israel actually. 
Okay. So they were successful up to some extent, but not with the full parameters of the skin reverse aging. Okay. But yeah, definitely they were successful up to some extent. I was very happy to read that because sometime my gray hair will also turn to black. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I I okay, think I will also read that article. It sounds interesting. Okay. okay. I I will share with you. I have it. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Mimansa. Okay. So, uh, Mimansa, I will go with the next question actually. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, by Rohit Sukla, and he is asking, please suggest some MRI and PET data resources for Alzheimer's disease, except ADMI. <laughs> We know that ADMI okay. is very standard database, but yeah, you yeah, have... yeah. yeah, you can actually go to this uh, website called synapse.org and it has a lot of data sets and it's very easy to apply the, uh, to these uh, studies. There is a study called Edneuromed, which is from Oxford. And uh, this is also uh, because it's a Europe based study. And then uh, I have a list of some other uh, um, other sources. Maybe I could share it with, with you later. But what I can recollect is right now the public publicly available. And also you should look into this IBL database, AIBL. This is from Australia. So they also have uh, the similar way of uh, similar way of measurement as of family. Yes, and uh, there is one uh, ILWAR.org. That website is also providing you lots of biomedical image data. And there yeah. is another for MRI and PET. I can suggest you one more that is CAI square R. That is also very popular and very good database. CAI square R. I will some of the some of the databases. Square R. Okay. Yeah. And okay. I would also suggest one more called DP UK. So you can okay. also look into that. Yeah. Maybe sure, I'll we can yeah. Okay, we have few more queries actually in waiting. Like uh, we have from uh, one query from Arundhati. Uh, she is asking, what role will the latest success of uh, Alpha Fold Two and Deep Mind will play in diagnosis of Alzheimer's? Can it modify the way the way we study Alzheimer's? Okay. I am not aware of it. Sorry, Alpha Fold Two and DeepMind. If you can clarify a little bit more, maybe I will. I can uh, answer your query. Okay, these are some uh, I think recent uh, deep learning based uh, servers. Uh, okay. What can be uh, what can be other dimensionality reduction method? This is asked by Muskan. Okay, so the dimensionality reduction method one could be PCA, which is the most common uh, dimensionality reduction method. But because it doesn't give us, uh, like we cannot trace back to our features from PCA, that's one of the hindrance. And the other one which I have mentioned is autoencoders. And there are like two types of autoencoders. One is sparse autoencoders, the other is variational autoencoders. So this you can note down. So basically in autoencoders, you can also trace back to your features and you can see that what is the relative importance of each of your features. Okay. Uh... I can write it down in the chat. We have another query from uh... Rochna uh, Premnik, which is related to like uh, the earlier query. What are the prospects of using artificial intelligence in Alzheimer's disease? Like how beneficial can be Neuralink, which could be used as a brain machine interface? So basically, she is asking about the role of AI in AD. Yeah, so I think, the, uh, yeah, I, I think according to my talk, as I showed you, it's uh, very much beneficial now AI is booming and AI is being used for and to understand all the diseases. And because Alzheimer's disease is a very complex disease, I think AI is very, very beneficial to understand the complexity and to break down the complexity of this disease. So this is the future, I would say. And uh, one announcement to all the participants, uh, 
the feedback come certificate link has been posted in the chat box so please fill that form before leaving thank you very much so mimansa we have few more queries for you okay uh, Smriti Gaba is asking, what is the relationship between aluminium and Alzheimer's disease? Do younger adults can suffer from Alzheimer's disease also? Younger adults, yeah, they can suffer from uh, Alzheimer's disease as well. There is also one early onset Alzheimer's disease. If you uh, would know that there is a G, it's, it's a genetic it's basically a hereditary disease and then it's not very common but it is still existing and the person of 25 or 26 year of age can also have that there is a very interesting study called din din study on that um, early onset alzheimer's disease but the okay uh, the major part of the alzheimer's disease is familial alzheimer's disease which usually occurs in, in older people and not in younger people Yes, now we can see in research also many cases are coming with young people having Alzheimer's, but it's not very mm -hmm. common. It's okay, not common, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ismati is again asking like when brain is reduced, as you have shown in the picture also, one normal mm -hmm. with bigger size, one reduced when Alzheimer's disease is there. So when brain is reduced, how do internal body functions take place? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think when I mean, I because I'm not a biologist, so I cannot explain you like how it functions. But what I understand that it can uh, because when your memory or your hippocampus is shrunk, your memory capabilities will reduce and then you cannot perform the functions later on, which you would normally perform. So there are certain pathways being affected, affected in your in your body. I, I cannot uh, give you like the name of the uh, of the pathway, but there are certain pathways which are affecting in the body, which can basically uh, not uh, make you function properly, but can affect your activities of daily living. So, brain shrinkage of the brain is the main cause of dementia and then you are finally in later on in dementia because people suffer from i think later on pneumonia right and then they have the several uh, severe organ failure and then they finally uh, leads to death yeah this is the major problem yeah definitely smati and you know uh, when brain size is reduced normally the main uh, cognitive functions are being affected actually yeah. and that's how the patients are not able to do their daily routine activities and at the later stage they even forget that food has to be taken to the mouth by the spoon that's also a yeah. problem okay uh, there is one more question like agam is asking what is the basis for calculating cognitive scores i think you okay. also have used cognitive scores in your research yeah, yeah. yeah. So there are certain uh, certain um, parameters. It's not just one. So if I can explain, if I can give an example of uh, mini mental state examination. So this is one of the study. Uh, this is one of the tests which is done for Alzheimer's disease, and it is basically it's a collection of various tests. Tests. So a patient come to the doctor, and then there are certain uh, pen and paper tests. Like the doctor would tell you to maybe draw a clock you know and how accurately you can draw a clock and this is also one of the thing how accurately you can um, you can draw a pattern which was already mentioned and then there there should, would be some questionnaires which which are testing your cognitive abilities so uh, and also there are certain certain functional for example for functional activities i can tell you that there are certain tests which will which will be asked by the for the uh, from the doctor to the caregiver and the caregiver will has to will have to answer that what if the person was able to perform a particular activity maybe eating food himself how much help he was he required and was he not able to perform the activity at all and this is rated between 0 to 5 or something so there are separate uh, like tests for concentration, for appoint managing appointments, you know, for visual. There are uh, too many tests for these uh, cognition, not just one. Okay. 
I was just looking at the stats, me Mansa, for your uh, talk and how many people have attended, and I found in my Google Meet, 133 total transactions were there. Okay. This much of people have listened to you, and I'm That's sure they great. have enjoyed. Yeah. Total 133. Okay. I have the list now with me. Okay. And I think that's it for all. I think we have covered all the queries. And okay. thank you very much for the wonderful information. I am sure many students were also there from even JP University. Mm -hmm. I can see uh, Dr. Sundar Rajan. Sundar, da, are you there? Oh, yeah, I am here. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It was very then, good. Suddenly, I saw the invitation. Really, it's uh, a good work from uh, Mimon Sam. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Siva, our BTEC student earlier. Uh, you know, Mimon sir, Dr. Sundarda is now in Singapore. He settled over there. He's okay. a scientist in Singapore. Okay. Thank you, Sundarda, for joining us. Also yeah, he's informatics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Data, science. data, data science and bioinformatics. Okay. Good to know you, sir. Uh, welcome, welcome. We can do some collaboration. Uh, if we have data, then I'm there always to do uh, anything. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, we have data. Now we have lots of data, like virtual data yeah. we can share. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure. My yeah. specialty, I prefer the neural networks. OK, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. We are also okay. doing a lot of yeah. We'll be in touch. Uh, we'll be in touch. We can um, plan something yeah. later. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. I can see okay. Gurnoor is also here. <laughs> Hi, Gurnoor. Gurnoor, you are so, on mute. Yeah. 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 Hi, Gurnoor. So first of all, Hello, I would sir. like to formally thank uh, Mimansa for joining us for the wonderful talk and I'm sure everybody has enjoyed this talk and this was the fifth in this series and we are going to have more in future you know Gurnur is also coming for a talk maybe in future after a month <laughs> or two I'm sure because now he is in Denmark so thank you Mimansa thank you very much for thank this talk thank you so much sir thank you for giving me the opportunity and it was really nice to connect again with all of you yeah and maybe looking forward if I come to when I come to India, maybe I'm looking forward to visit you. Sure, sure. You are always welcome. Yeah. Okay.